Moving on, today a Russian security company reported that it discovered one of the biggest bank robberies ever. No guns involved, hackers did it, breaking into more than 100 banks in 30 countries and making off with a total of as much as $1 billion. Here's Anna Werner. The authors of the report call it the great bank robbery of the modern era. Their ultimate goal was to steal as much money as possible and they largely accomplished that. Chris Doggett is managing director for Kaspersky Lab, the computer security firm that uncovered the scheme. Your very basic hacker guys are all about getting in and stealing whatever they can get their hands on. The way these guys are different is they were really a combination of hackers, spies, and thieves. The criminals often use the simplest of methods to get into banks, an email attachment with a virus sent to bank employees. When the employee clicked on it, the hackers gained access to the bank's financial systems, then spied to see how the employees and the systems worked. They went in and actually changed the balances in accounts at the bank so that it looked to the bank like there was more money in that account than there actually really was in reality. They then used e-payment systems and online banking systems and ATM machines and even the SWIFT financial network to then transfer the money out of those accounts into other accounts that they had set up for themselves. Often the hackers sent commands to ATMs to just spew out money and then they'd have a person standing there to collect it. The losses are huge. One bank lost nearly $10 million when the hackers targeted its online banking platform. Another was hit for $7.3 million through ATM fraud. It's not clear yet how many banks in the U.S. were affected or whether they lost money. Now, the American Bankers Association told us today, quote, there's no evidence U.S. banks were infiltrated. But Doggett's group, Scott, found U.S. banks were definitely targeted. Imagine what Bonnie and Clyde would think. <laughs> Anna, thank you very much. SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, is going through a midlife crisis. The network operator is the backbone of payment services for more than 11,000 institutions across more than 200 countries and territories, including banks and corporations. If a bank is wiring money to someone, chances are SWIFT is involved somewhere along the way. The transaction messaging behemoth touts a failure is not an option level of security. That includes its data centers in three low-profile locations in Switzerland, the Netherlands, Virginia, and a fourth operation site known only to a handful of SWIFT executives. But a series of recent cyber attacks targeting banks raises questions about the security of the SWIFT network and the global banking system's heavy reliance on it. SWIFT says its core messaging platform is uncompromised. SWIFT began in Belgium in 1973 as a cooperative of 239 banks, aiming to replace Telex. By the time the system went live in 1977, its 518 member banks from 22 countries were sending 51,700 messages a day. Daily message volumes on SWIFT exceeded 25 million in July 2016, and the network now handles more than 6 billion messages a year. The company continues to grow rapidly, adding a range of ancillary products and services. It also has been adding operations in emerging markets, which sometimes have less sophisticated security practices and have been the source of recent customer breaches. In 2015, hackers stole $9 million from a bank customer of SWIFT in Ecuador and attempted another attack on a bank in Vietnam. In February 2016, hackers walked away with $81 million from Bangladesh's central bank, which had an account with the New York Fed. The hackers have not been identified. SWIFT's authentication process is designed to check that a message's sender and receiver are who they say they are. But if hackers gain control of a user's credentials, SWIFT may not detect the intrusion until it's too late. SWIFT also considers user and security to be the responsibility of its customers. It doesn't always audit customer sites to ensure compliance with network guidelines. 
Swift revealed in September three new cyber breaches without disclosing their scale or locations or the banks affected. More breaches may have occurred since then. The recent breaches at customer sites are forcing Swift to make crucial changes in the way it operates. It has hired cyber forensic teams, distributed software patches, and is publishing anonymized incident reports on a restricted part of its network so that users can track attack developments. Swift's lead regulator is the National Bank of Belgium, which is asking the company to continuously report developments. Overall, Swift is overseen by the world's largest central banks, including the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is actively monitoring Swift's response to cyber attacks. A significant global outage would slow payments to a crawl. Swift isn't the only messaging service for large payments, but it is easily the most popular one, and switching to alternatives would be possible, but difficult. Swift's progress reports will be closely watched, given its mission-critical role in banking. Hello, welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. The digital currency Bitcoin, once a toy for computer nerds, is now soaring in price, triggering a new gold rush. Is it just another bubble or the glimpse of the radically new financial future? Well, I ask Rick falk of Bitcoin Cash and founder of the Swedish Pirate Party. The new Bitcoin craze is making people rush into cryptocurrency investment with the digital money skyrocketing value putting it into the spotlight. But aside from causing a new gold rush, Bitcoin is promising to completely transform the way we use money. What will peer-to-peer -peer money exchange do to the global banking system? What role will the world's governments be left with when Bitcoin goes global? And can it overcome its unstable nature to bring about a radical financial revolution? Rick Falkvillier, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you on our program. Um, now, you predicted Bitcoin's thousand-fold increase back in 2011, and indeed, from $1 in February 2011, hit a record high of almost $7,880 last week, then had a plunge and is back up again. Now, why does it keep growing, and is there any price limit for Bitcoin? Yes, there is a price limit for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. It, is not, it cannot displace more money than exists in the world. So there is an upper ceiling. But that upper ceiling, uh, if you're just regarding Bitcoin as a commodity on the market, which I think it is, like any currency, can easily go to one million or more per Bitcoin. Now, it's important to remember that Bitcoin might not be the final cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency will displace the uh, central bank money. But with social networks, we had Six Degrees, which was replaced by Friendster, which was replaced by MySpace, which was replaced by Facebook. So some cryptocurrency is going to be worth a lot of money. Which one? Well, that's a gamble. Goldman Sachs CEO Lloyd Blankfein says Bitcoin may be another bubble, just like that of the dot-coms. And JP Morgan's Chase CEO Jamie Dimon compares cryptocurrency to the Dutch 17th century tulip mania. Don't these men have a point? I mean, a bubble forms when there is public ignorance, and with Bitcoin, most people have a vague idea of what it is and how it works. I think that I think you absolutely have a point that, that most people don't really understand what Bitcoin is. It is peer-to-peer -peer electronic money. That means I have a phone here. I can use that phone to transfer money to a nearby phone or to a phone on the other side of the planet. The transfer is instant. It is practically free. Nobody gets to decide whether I can make that transaction or not, including financial authorities. And that in itself will mean a financial revolution. This is an extinction level event for banks. Banks will no longer be a necessary middleman. And that's more than anything why I believe that this is the future of finance. So way back in February, the Bangladesh Bank was the victim of a cyber attack where hackers got away with 81 million bucks. It was a lot of money. Now, it would have been even more money if the hackers hadn't made a suspicious typo on their attempted transfers, which ended up making the bank end up canceling the rest of them and then looking into it. So it turns out that these hackers may very well have been hacking into a part of a financial platform software suite by a company called Swift for the Society of Worldwide Interbank Financial 
financial telecommunications. SWIFT is a co-op owned by 3,000 financial institutions and their software facilitates communications to over 11,000 banking institutions for payment orders and transfers. So SWIFT users must be authorized banks. So it is suspected that the Bangladesh bank hacker used their lack of network infrastructure to gain access to the bank network and as such, the SWIFT network as well, which allowed them to receive several compromised transfers from the bank, $81 million worth. Could have been one billion bucks if they didn't get caught. So SWIFT reported on Monday that they were aware of malware in their systems, which they suspect is being used to target their clients. A part of the software suite called Alliance Access Server Software is the suspected vulnerable vector. The malware used would modify Access Alliance's database of transfer logs, along with deleting account records, manipulating account balances so nothing was suspected, and it even manipulated hard copies of transfers that were printed by the Bangladesh bank's printer. So Swift released a security update and a press release about the malware on Monday. While the only instance of this malware being used in the wild is with the Bangladesh bank, it is a heist on a huge scale. So if Swift clients do not update their systems with the security patch, they could easily be next if they don't take proper precautions as well, like not using a $10 network switch for starters. I feel like that would be a good idea. I mean, the one thing is that everyone in this room we can exchange an email with but we cannot exchange money with. We have to make sure that their system talks to ours and vice versa. And so in, in, back to what Dilip described, how did we solve that as an industry? It's called SMTP. There's a standard that allows protocol. interoperability, a protocol that allows interoperability. For Ripple, we have championed a technology called the Interledger Protocol. And this is what we build our technologies on top of and allows real-time interoperability between ledgers. This idea that there's gonna be one ledger to rule them all. No. You know, as you and I have discussed previously, you know, Ripple has taken some contrarian bets early, and one of them was, look, we don't think there's going to be one ledger to rule them all. You need to think about interoperability between ledgers and connecting the ledgers so that we can let value move the way information moves today. So let's talk about the problem that Ripple is trying to solve. Maybe you want to start with how money moves between banks right now and let people know a little bit about that. Well, given that we're at Money 2020, I'm guessing many people in the audience know this well, but uh, the, the, you know, the nature of blockchain technology is to allow two parties to transact without trust by eliminating that central, and eliminating that central counterparty. Correspondent banking is a series of central counterparties. If we can leverage blockchain, blockchain technologies to change correspondent banking, where you're hopping between bank to bank to currency to currency, where each bank is adding time, is adding some cost, if we can fundamentally democratize how correspondent banking works today, we can not only change the goal of talking about 300 basis points that Dilip was talking about, we talk about 30 basis points. That to me is what we should you know, aspire to. In 2030, that's 12 years from now. And we have a lot of money parked in correspondent banking, right? Just to do that. Just to be able to do trades on maybe Monday to Friday. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, you, you do have the, the problem today of you know banks being closed on the weekend. You know, there's all kinds of stories that I'm sure many of us have heard of, you know, a transaction that gets stuck. But I think particularly younger generations are used to the expectation that they have access to information, they have access to their funds 24/7. Why should you know my ability to transact stop? Be limited. Know, be, Friday at 3 p.m. because there's a wire cut off. Reuters and other media have uncovered several cases involving hackers taking advantage of vulnerabilities within the International System for Money Transfers to siphon at least $93 million from banks in South America and Asia. The attacks all combine modern tactics of hacking into computers with malware and old-fashioned money laundering skills. The most dramatic example is in Bangladesh. On February the 4th, 2016, $81 million of Bangladesh Bank's money was moved from New York Federal Reserve to a bank in the Philippines. That's a lot of money, but things could have been worse. They tried to transfer nearly $1 billion. What do you need for a heist like this? You need some way to get into the bank's system. You need a way to gain access to the SWIFT money transfer network. You need some malware to cover your tracks. And then you need a bank account preferably in a likely regulated country, to receive the money. Investigators have not said how the hackers got into the computers that Bangladesh Bank uses to access the SWIFT system, but some sources say it was probably by sending an infected email 
to one of the staff. Once in, they would have studied the bank's system and installed their malware. The main purpose of the malware was to cover their tracks as they committed the crime. When the staff are off work, it's showtime for the hackers. They log on to the swift messaging system and start sending requests to withdraw funds. Most are rejected, but some go through. All these successful transfers go from the New York Federal Reserve and its correspondent banks to bank accounts in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. One alert staffer at Deutsche Bank spots a typo in the name of the intended Sri Lankan recipient and queries the transaction. The New York Fed also sends multiple queries to Bangladesh Bank but gets no response. Altogether, four requests, totaling $81 million, are already on their way. After the requests are sent, the malware goes to work, buying time for the money to be collected and laundered. It checks the SWIFT messaging system and deletes any incoming messages that might alert bank officials about their fraudulent transfers. It also deletes any confirmation messages before they're sent to the office printer. It's a Friday, a weekend day in Muslim Bangladesh, and when the skeleton staff come in, all they see is an empty printer tray and an apparently broken printer. That is not that unusual. The boss tells someone to fix it and heads off for midday prayers. Meanwhile, the money has landed in four fake accounts in a small manila branch of a Philippine bank called RCBC. Some of the money is transferred to another fake account in the same branch. That afternoon, one of the branch employees summons an armored car from head office which dumps 20 million pesos. Some of the staff count the money and pack it in a paper bag. It's loaded into a car and driven off. Over the weekend, Bangladesh bank officials wake to the scale of the problem. The malware appears to have disabled the swift messaging system. They print out the swift messages manually and try to contact the New York Fed via phone email and fax. There's no response from the New York Fed office that is typically not staffed on weekends. Swift remotely fixed the messaging system. It's now Monday in Bangladesh and officials realize where the money has gone and send Swift messages to RCBC asking them to stop the transfers. But it's a public holiday in the Philippines and those messages don't get read until Tuesday morning. And crucially, they're sent as ordinary messages, not cancel requests so they join a pile of hundreds of routine messages in the bank's headquarters. Eventually they're passed on to the branch, but officials in the branch ignore them and transfer the money to other accounts, with much of it ending up in Philippine casinos. Investigations are now going on around the globe, but no one has been arrested or charged. And other cases have now come to light in Ecuador, Vietnam, the Philippines and other countries. Not all were successful and all are dwarfed by the Bangladesh heist. More cases are expected to come to light. But the hackers, whoever they are, remain hidden. And, and there was something very interesting I learned from one of your uh, speeches uh, earlier on talks, that Swift has an error problem. Uh, you want to talk about that? You know, it, it's a really good point. And I, I sometimes struggle with how to describe this because I grew up in Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, to be fair, I moved there 20 years ago. But in my professional life, I grew up in Silicon Valley. And in Silicon Valley, if you're in the tech industry, you talk about you know three nines of reliability, 99.9% .9 reliability, or four nines of reliability. Six sigma and all that. Yeah, so think about this. You know, when you use Google, the search box on Google, it always works. I mean, the the the, the success rate is 99.9999. I think it's six nines. Imagine if six out of every 100 searches you typed into Google didn't work. It just failed. Six percent. Six percent. Six percent. Swift's published error rate is six percent. Now, I, you, I will talk to corporate treasury people and they'll tell you it's actually higher than 6%, uh, but even if it's 6%. So what happens if it's 6%? I mean, well, it means that you know, human intervention is required because, hey, somebody misspelled Faisal, you fat fingered that account number, Faisal's account number doesn't match Faisal's name, and it, it's a reason why there are thousands and thousands of people embedded in error correcting and chasing down those those payments that kind of get lost in the system. Imagine if that happened with email, 6%. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine. That's a good, if 6% of your emails didn't go through without human intervention, uh, yeah, that, that would, that would our, the information Bummer. society we live in today would not work. And you don't come from a banking background, so you not also don't come from a cryptography background or a computer science background. Just to, And yet here you are, CEO of a company, that is using cryptography mathematics to solve an old age problem of you know, remitting money real time. 
Well, I, I'll say a couple things. One is I've always been a bit of a geek and you know, did some coding earlier in my life, but never you no know, formal training around computer science uh, beyond you know, basic stuff way back when. But t to me, the reason why Ripple has been successful is because we've focused on a clear problem for a clear customer. You know, there are a lot of companies at, at Money 2020 that are thinking about blockchain technologies. The best counsel I can offer is understand what customer you're serving, understand what problem you're solving. There's a lot of people out there that I, I, I think it's a technology in search of a problem instead of a problem in search of a technology. Even when I got to Ripple about three years ago, we were looking at a bunch of different use cases for blockchain. We we're thinking about identity, we we're thinking about smart contracts. We decided to focus on one. And that focus has meant we have hundreds of people focused on solving that problem for our customers. And we now have well over 100 banks and financial institutions around the world that are working with us. Uh, we just announced our product that uses XRP to deliver that liquidity. We, we productized that in Q3 last year. Uh, we announced our first customers. Uh, today, you know, we have some of the largest payment providers in the world using uh, XRP for their payment flows into Mexico. At the end of the day, if you're solving a problem, meaning we're reducing the cost and increasing the speed, I'm very optimistic about the continued adoption of XRP as solving that problem because it works. Our first uh, talk is a discussion with, uh, with uh, Miriam from Ripple. Miriam, can you, can you please join us? Okay, let's take places. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, very impressive. Uh, you decided to uh, to come and to join the community. Uh, can you please introduce uh, uh, yourself and uh, talk about your my background? Yeah. Well, thank you first of all for inviting and considering Oracle. Uh, my name is Maria Angelatina. I, I used to work for Swift for ten years. Uh, my name is Maria Angelatina. I, I used to work for Swift for 10 years. My last assignment was uh, uh, responsible for GPI, Global Payments Innovation. And since uh, 10, more than 10 months, I joined Ripple. Um, so I wanted to be more disruptive uh, in this very changing landscape. So I think we've reached a very successful conclusion. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So it's my understanding you're flying out this evening? Yes. Arigatou I got to Success. There you go. Oh, thank you. Hi, Ian. Look, I know you've put a lot of work in on this, so I thought you should be the first to know. We've signed the contract. Fantastic. Does that mean that I can push the green light on this end? Hi, Ian. It's Anya. We're almost complete. We also just wanted to keep you in the loop with the payment. Yep. You should see all the details in front of you now. Fantastic. Time is of the essence. The deadline for our first shipment goes out this afternoon. And we've also just sent Mr. Tanaka the payment request, which is everything he needs. Yep. Looks like he's got it.
Taxi! Hey guys, uh, look, I know it's getting late there. I can track the payment and keep you posted. Oh, there's no need for you to do that, Ian. Thank you. Payment is complete. We just got access to the funds. Perfect. around this. Uh, what really um, interested me um, when I was working uh, uh, in the, you know, some innovation project is, uh, is the vision of the Ripple. Uh, the vision of where the internet of value. I think probably you have heard about it, there are lots of uh, information about Ripple everywhere, but I think the essence of this, uh, this vision is very interesting. When we look at the, the way that the internet is used to exchange data, to the way that the cross-border uh, payments or the transfer of value has been made, uh, we see a big difference. Um, it's still easier, you know, to move money in your luggage from US to UK uh, than sending it to a bank. So I think really internet of value means that you can as smoothly as possible move funds that you, you exchange information in the internet. Um, so that has been really the, let's say, the, the driver behind this change. And, um, I should say that I'm uh, positively uh, impressed. It's a difficult job creating a new uh, global network because, as, as, as you know, um, the commerce is, is global and uh, um, the, our, our use case actually is a cross-border payment. So there's a lot of, I should say, challenges, but it's, uh, um, it's my best experience so far uh, in my career. So let's start with the 100 banks. Do the, do the banks use XRP to transfer? No, the, the vast majority of the banks we have announced are working with our product called XCurrent. And XCurrent is a messaging solution that allows two banks that already have a bilateral relationship, already have that Nostra-Vostra relationship you were describing earlier, to more efficiently debit and credit those accounts. 24-7. 24-7, no problem. Where XRapid, which is our XRP solution to source liquidity comes in, is if so if the Bank of Faisal and the Bank of Brad already have a relationship, I can use XCurrent to manage that process. If we now want to settle to the Bank of Audience, I don't have, I don't know what currency the Bank of Audience is. We're, we're going to stick Singapore to, dollars. Uh, Singapore dollars. We don't have a Nostra account in Singapore dollars, but I need liquidity. Well, e even yesterday, I think, there's a, a new uh, regulated digital exchange announced here in Singapore. So if you hold US dollars, you can sell your US dollars, buy XRP, move XRP, which would take about three seconds, sell the XRP and buy Singapore dollars. That whole transaction can be completed in less than 10 seconds. You snuffed out volatility. The volatility, you know, it, it's fascinating. People, there's a lot of misinformation out there about digital assets broadly and certainly around Ripple. Volatility is not really, that's, that's, a, it's, it's a, that's fake news. Uh, you know, volatility, you're talking about three seconds of volatility risk. So you get, here's a, a crazy thought exercise. If the average SWIFT transaction is about two days, that's 48 hours, that's just shy of 180,000 seconds. Take my word for it, that's wow. the math. You can either do three seconds of an asset that is high, highly volatile, or you can do 180,000 seconds of an asset that is low volatility. It turns out there's more volatility risk using SWIFT and fiat than there is using XRP. Martin, can we have the uh, poll question? I want to take a very quick poll and we'll give the result towards the end. How many people think that payments, uh, cryptocurrency based payments, will become the norm in 2018? Yes, no, and a maybe. You can use your Slido to do that uh, and we'll come back to that. But let's, coming back to the 100 banks. Are the 100 banks, if, if another bank joins the network and it's 101, are they all able to? communicate with each other using your uh, X current platform? Yeah, that's, we, we call that RippleNet. And so we have uh, banks that have def agreed upon a rule set using the same software such they can efficiently participate. And it, you know, we, we now are signing up more than a bank, or, uh, a bank a week or a financial institution a week. So that the, the network effects are very strong here. The, the, more, the more nodes on a network, the value of that network increases by the square of the nodes. So every time we add another node to the network, the value of participating goes up, and so the value to the next bank to sign up, the next payment provider, next financial institution to sign up goes up. 
So the momentum is definitely building. Uh, I'll be interested to see what the, the survey says. Although, th to me, the survey, it isn't about whether you as an individual are using a crypto, a digital asset to make a payment. It's about how digital assets can be used in the infrastructure to dramatically accelerate what is the primary payment mechanism we use today through financial institutions. And you're not a, f a bank per se. You, you, you want to market or you do market yourself as a payment network or a processor? You know, it's a good question. I just got this question a couple days ago. Somebody said to me, are you a crypto company or a blockchain company? And I, I said, no, know. we're a payments company. Yeah, yeah. Payments. We, we happen to use cryptography. We happen to use blockchain technologies. We happen to use a digital asset to solve a payments problem. But in by, a decentralized manner. In a decentralized manner. The XRP ledger is a decentralized open source technology. Ripple vanishes tomorrow. If Ripple, the company, goes away. The XRP ledger will continue to persist. Including Ripple now? I hope Ripple doesn't go away, just for the record. But yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, so explain that part of decentralization. How does that work? And my second question to you is, because you're issuing a token, doesn't that make you a money transfer now in the eyes of most regulators? And if that, how would you go about that? So I'll take that second part. When we come back to the first part, if I forget the first part, please ask me again. I want to talk about regulation because there's so much uncertainty that pe people perceived uncertainty, really. You know, uh, what we all experienced in the digital asset market was a lot of, you know, in January, the markets, you know, rumors out of India, rumors out of South Korea, things sold off. And I, I, I tweeted out recently. Uh, you had a good year, 20,000%. <laughs> 20,000 percent increase. I tweeted out recently. I, I'm ignoring that for the moment because uh, I... I I tweeted, regulatory uncertainty is a, it's a euphemism in my opinion. It's, it's a euphemism for, I don't agree with the regulation. The regulatory certainty, I mean look, there is clear regulatory frameworks for doing payments. And yes, you have to have KYC information, you have to do AML checks, you have to do BSA checks. We can list the three letter acronyms and four letter acronyms that come after that. This idea that there's regulatory uncertainty to me is trying to pretend that crypto somehow shouldn't adhere to the regulations that already exist. That's just not the real world. I mean, one of the reasons why Ripple was controversial and contrarian early on is because we said that the, the revolution of blockchain isn't gonna happen from outside the system. It's gonna happen from within the system. Many in the blockchain community have espoused, excuse me, many in the Bitcoin community have espoused this idea that, you know, down with government, down with banks. Look, R Ripple's taking the position that governments aren't going away. I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon. And so if you want to dramatically change the nature of how payments flow, if you want to solve Dilip's problem that he's talking about earlier, you want to work with the system. You want to work with the regulators. And when regulators understand that using Ripple's technology and using XRP through the flow that I described, you're going from one regulated institution to another regulated institution. There's a KYC account, a KYC verified account on both ends. There's AML checks on both ends. There's no regulatory uncertainty. And coming to the earlier question. What was it? Oh. It was a really good question. I know. But we forgot. We forgot. <laughs> Okay, uh, quick question. Uh, within the crypto community, Ripple is considered to go against everything that crypto stands for. Why do you think this belief exists? Well, I think it's what we we're just talking about. You know, uh, to, to use the, the, the crypto parlance, we're working with the man. The crypto community wants to kill the man. Uh, you know, look, I, I just take the point of view that the most effective way to have an impact, to really to dramatically change how the world works is not to pretend that governments are gonna go away. We can have, and the progress we have made, in my opinion, in the last three years is astounding. Yeah, no doubt. It, it's incredible to me. And it's because we're not trying to, we're, we're not trying to blow up the system. We're working with the system. And, and talking about working with the system, you will not be, and you know I think you're cognizant that you will not be the only network out there and there are other networks you know, who are doing fantastic jobs and will. Absolutely. How will you all work together? Well, that goes back to the interoperability discussion we were having earlier. The, you know, the, I think some would like to believe in a world where everyone adopts one ledger and you know, every transaction is happening through that one open ledger. I, I don't think that's going to exist. And I think that we are... We have a multitude of... You know, oh, different kinds of ledgers, securities ledgers. Securities that's where your ILP ledgers. comes in. That's exactly right.
Well, that's how we, I think we truly deliver an internet maybe, of value. We have a minute. Maybe you want to explain what ILP is. So ILP stands for Interledger Protocol. You know, in the same way I think the Internet of Information was built on technologies like TCP IP and HTTP, we believe the Internet of Value will be built upon ILP, the Interledger Protocol. And this That's is a, an open source an open source technology that we have embedded and partnered with a bunch of companies around the world. Uh, it'll continue to evolve and develop. Certainly we have been a protagonist and some of the inventors of ILP work at Ripple. Networks can connect That's exactly seamlessly. Right. That's exactly and right. And they could be any Bitcoin to XRP to JPY to... And the multi-hop across, you want to go from a JPM, JP Morgan ledger to through Bitcoin, through ACH, and pay out on Linlin Pay? Okay, no problem. And are we seeing these rollouts happen? We, we actually did a, a demonstration of a test where it, you went through seven different ledgers through ILP at the same time. And one quick, quick last point. You're not just working with banks, you're working with payment providers, NBFIs as well, wallet providers, telcos, and MNOs that can actually exchange value, correct? I mean, that, to me, that's part of the example of it's not going to be one ledger to rule them all. When I say, I often probably make the mistake, I say banks, and then I'll correct myself and say financial institutions. And look, it, it, to me, anyone who is helping a consumer or business host value and move value, we want to work with them. We want to enable Exxon, who might be banking with Satander, to enable payouts to their drivers in Nigeria using Impeza. Mm. Today, Exxon wants to do that, and that's a really hard problem for them. Through technologies that we're talking about here, to in real-time interoperability, such that Satander can execute a payment and have it settle into Impeza in seconds, that's a big change from where we are today. And again, I'll go back to D Dillup's presentation earlier. If we're successful, by 2030, we're not going to be talking about 300 basis points. We're going to be talking about 30 basis points. Which will do magic for the uh, global economy. Without question. Can we have the results for the poll of what people actually put up? Let's see. So 49% said no. 30, well, so 30, to, yes. to me, the, I agree. I would have said no. Because what I'm saying here, it, the audience will be making cryptocurrency-based payments this year. I mean, look, let's just by show of hands. How many people here have used a Bitcoin, an XRP, or Ethereum, or anything to buy something personally? And a second time, how many of you have done it more than once? So some people, they've done it once, it's a novelty, that's kind of cool. But look, I, I mean, you may notice, I don't even use the word cryptocurrency. It's not a currency today. I can't go to Amazon, I can't go to Starbucks, I can't use, these aren't currencies, I, they're digital assets today. Maybe one day they will be cryptocurrencies, but today, I, I talk about them as digital assets. That doesn't mean they're not, they can't be used to solve a real problem at scale. But I, I, don't, I agree. I don't think you know, most people in the audience will be using cryptocurrency this year for payments. Uh, I think they might be using it through a financial institution. It might be totally invisible to them. Right? I mean, I, I know we're running out of time, but there's lots of examples today where we have corporates in Sweden settling into the US dollar in seconds. The corporate doesn't know that it's going through blockchain technologies. It's just solving a problem. Brad, thank you very much for taking the time out. I know you've been flying for quite a few days, and you probably don't even know which city you're in. But <laughs> thank you very much. Thank uh, you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Ripple, I think, is a very interesting um, company. I, I can tell you because I'm coming from uh, a, a world that was more old um, and at the service of the banks. I think Ripple, what he's doing is, is, um, um, is creating a new ecosystem uh, by leveraging the, uh, the blockchain technology, uh, but really uh, in a way that the banks and the financial in, uh, institution can follow actually the, the pace of change. So our, our vision is around uh, creating an internet of value. So, um, so the idea is that today when you exchange information in internet, this takes seconds. But still, when you want to um, exchange value and send cross-border transaction, this could uptake up to a uh, few days. Um, our vision is to make this exchange of value as fastest and smoothest as the information is exchanged today. <music>